Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> I'm Marilyn Gay, and I'll be the service leader today. My pronouns are she and her. And um, rather than make a longer introduction, let's move right into our opening hymn, which is number 389, Gathered Here. And if you don't want to bother fumbling for pages, it will be visible behind me on the screen. <laughs> As Unitarian Universalists, we are bound together not by a common set of beliefs, but by our promise to support one another in our individual searches for truth and meaning, guided by our principle and drawing from many sources. We hope that you all feel welcome here, whatever you believe or don't believe, whoever you love, however you understand family, Whatever your age, race, or ability, you are all welcome here. We invite you to join us in a journey of free thought, spiritual questing, and justice making for as long as you feel comfortable doing so. We extend a special welcome to our visitors this morning. Who's a visitor, huh? Oh, great, great, good to see you. And uh, please join us after the service for coffee and conversation. <sighs> now, I wish to acknowledge our presence on Treaty 6 land. We're gathering, acknowledging that we are located on Treaty 6 territory. We respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all other First Nations peoples of Canada, whose presence constitutes continues to enrich our vibrant community. You may have been taught that the missionaries and the settlers who came here two centuries ago accused the First Nations people of being pagans, as if that was something bad, as something sinful. Well, this is now. And today we're going to explore some pagan ideas and practices with respect and with insight uh, in, in ways that are relevant to us today. There is some overlap between native spirituality and what is considered traditional pagan worship. And we find that to be a positive thing. Uh, now we'll have a prelude. And the prelude will be uh, a piano piece played by Karen Mills. It's entitled Keepsake, and the composer is Janine Yeager.
I'd like to call Erica Deneuve forward to light our two chalices. We light one as is our usual practice as Unitarians to focus our attention and to bring a quiet spirit to our gathering. The other one is lit because we are constantly mindful of the tragic events and suffering in the Ukraine and we want to keep them in our hearts. To have a tranquil and focused experience this morning, um, I ask you to, if you have not already, to silence your um, communication devices. This is a reading that has been prepared for the chalice lighting. As we draw near to the thinning of the veil, may we have the courage to light the flame within, within us that speaks out of our own truth. May this flame remind us of where we have come from and where we are now and how we can be the best ancestor to our beloveds. Thank you, Erica. Now, the hymn of the month. Um, you know, I forgot announcements. Oh, dear. We have two announcements that I'd like to bring to your attention um, before, before we have the hymn of the month. You might look it up. It's in the teal-colored um, hymnal, number 1015. I know I can. Our announcements are simple, and Susan Rutan will come forward to speak from the board. This is just a reminder that at the end of next week's service on the 6th of November, there will be a congregational meeting. All members are invited to stay for that. Uh, won't be a long one, uh, but important to have people here. The second announcement is simple. The um, clutter that sometimes takes up space in the social hall has been cleared away so that anyone who wishes to walk the labyrinth walk um, can, can enjoy that walk after the service today. Now, the hymn of the month. I know I can. Hello, everybody. 
Welcome. My name is Reverend Rosemary Morrison, and it is my pleasure and honor to serve this congregation. I'm so happy to see all of you out this morning, and what an event we had last night for Samhain. So many of you were here, and so many people that I had never seen before. It was truly wonderful. And to continue on with the theme, I'm going to read a little book called Ghosts Hour, Spooks Hour by Eve Bunting and illustrated by Donald Carrick. It's a cute little book. Are we going to be able to put the pictures up on the screen? It's up. Well, there we go. So this is from this little boy's perspective. When I woke up, it was really dark. Something went woo outside of my window. Don't be scared, I told myself. It's just the wind. And I slid out of bed. The, an icy wetness touched my toes and I leaped back. Ew, what was that? Then I remembered Biff, my big white dog sleeps under my bed at night. Biff has the coldest, wettest nose. Hi, Biff, I said. I felt for the bedside lamp and pushed the button. Nothing happened. I pushed it again. Nothing happened again. Oh, oh, Biff, I whispered. I, I don't like this. Let's get out of here. My bedroom door moaned when I opened it. Biff moaned. It's okay, I said. I think this door always creaks. I, I think it sounds louder at night. But it was good to have Biff along. This boy is scared. We padded fast along the ha hallway to my parents' room. Mom, I whispered. Dad? No one answered. I clicked the light switch. No light again. Ooh, went the wind. Ooh. I shuffled across the bed and felt around. The sheets were warm and lumpy, but the bed was empty. Where were Mom and Dad? Ooh, Biff howled. Quit that, I said though I wanted to howl myself, where could they be? Something went crack against the window. Creak, slither, whoosh. Something was out there. Black, snaky things point, pounced on the glass. <sighs> I tried to get behind Biff, but he was trying to get behind me. I made myself peer over his back. Ooh, phew, I said, standing up and uncurling my fingers from Biff's fur. It's only our black snaky tree branches, silly Biff. You don't have to be this scared. Let's go find Mom and Dad. He's not putting on a brave face, if you can see the picture. He does not look very brave. He looks very scared. We stood at the top of the stairs with the dark pushing against us. Mom? Dad? My voice disappeared into the dark cave below. The dining room clock went boom, boom, boom. It goes on and on because it's midnight. <laughs> Twelve o'clock midnight, I said, and I thought, ghosts hour, spooks hour. But I didn't tell Biff, because he was already too scared. He threw himself across my feet, warm and trembly, in a way I wanted to stay here too, or run back to bed and pull the blankets over my head. But here, but here was too scary, and back there would be scarier still. Come, Biff, I said. He wouldn't. I gathered him up, but he'd made himself heavy. And he was hard to hold because of the shaking. 
Parts of him kept slipping as I carried him downstairs. Sounds like he's, poor Biff is pretty scared. Tick, tick, went the big clock. Swish, swish, went the pendulum. Clatter, rattle, shuffle, shift, went the dead leaves against the house. Through the long dining room windows, I saw a smoky moon with clouds piled high against it. Against it. Our table seemed monstrously big. Chairs humpbacked, clawed, and crouched around it. Ooh, Biff moaned. My heart gave a great jiggle. A horrible whiteness seemed to be moving toward me out of the dark. A shapeless blob-like whiteness. Ghost sour. Spook sour. Help, I yelled, dropping Biff in a heap and leaping, leaping backward against the table. Apples and oranges from the fruit bowl thudded past me to plomp, plop on the rug. Help, the blob-like whiteness yelled, dropping the front part of itself and leaping back too. So what do you think he saw? Wah! Biff was squirming to get below the table. Wah! The front part of the blob squirmed from the table too. Come back, Biff, I shouted. And then I remembered the big mirror in the, over the sideboard and knew the horrible whiteness had been me carrying the blob that was Biff. That's all. So why was I standing here, howling too? Howling just as loudly as Biff. Oh, finally, an adult. The dining room burst open and a voice said, Jake, is that you? Dad! I ran and jumped up on him and Biff ran and jumped up too. Hey, Dad laughed, his arms closed around me. I'm overflowing, he gasped. <laughs> I felt the scratchiness of his cheek and smelled his dad's smell. Biff's tail whipped against my legs. Mom was behind dad, holding a candle. The wind knocked, out, knocked the lights out, she said, and a tree branch was banging against our window. We decided to sleep down here on the couch. Biff thought, Biff thought you'd left us, I said. Just Biff thought that. <laughs> he was so scared, Mum stroked Biff's head. Silly Biff, don't you know we'd never leave you too? She stroked my hair too. There was room for all of us on the couch bed. Dad blew out the candle and we lay close in the dark. Outside, the w wind went woo, and the wind leaves went shh, shh, as they chased each other in the long grass. Don't worry about being scared, Mom told Biff. Everybody's scared sometimes. Yeah, Biff, I said. Don't worry about it at all. I held his warm paw and Mom's warm hand and con and counted moon shadows in the ceilings, ceiling until I fell asleep. Sometimes things aren't what they seem. Oops. <sighs> well, I think that we have spent about a half an hour here enjoying music and wonderful words from our minister. And in the background, we have volunteers who are taking care of all of the things that make this a good, a good service and a good experience. Our church is a freestanding institution. None of this is paid for by anyone except us. And so, with generosity and good intentions, we now will pass a collection plate so that you can make a financial offering to the church. 
many members have an automatic banking arrangement and don't put money in the plate each, each week. Now, for those of you that are watching on Zoom, there will be, ah, well, there will soon be uh, some information about how to make a contribution um, through uh, our website or through other banking arrangements. But um, we are very grateful for the generosity of the people who are connected and supportive of this church. Pardon? Ah, yes. Oh, yes. How can I forget? Child Haven is very close to my heart. One half of all of the funds that are unidentified collected from our, um, in, in our plate will be sent to Child Haven International, which is um, a wonderful institution that has 11 homes for children in need raising them, educating them, and bringing them back to their community as big contributors. This is all in taking place in India, Nepal, and Bangladesh. And um, so we're happy to support Child Haven with one half of our collected contributions to date. And now what? We're going to sing while we have the collection. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. And we will sing while we're having the collection. Uh, and it is the offertory hymn number 396, I Know This Rose Will Open. sing um, from you I receive. Geneva will come up with a special message. Good morning. My name is Erica Deneve. My pronouns are she, they, and I was here last night also doing the ancestor honoring ritual, and I was asked to speak again today about this holiday of Samhain. Samhain is not an ancient holiday. That statement may surprise you if you've spent any time in pagan spaces, where the claim is often made that the holidays on the wheel of the year predate Christianity. It is true that our pre-Christian ancestors had seasonal celebrations, because they were agricultural societies. But the rituals we celebrate today, more, most are less than 100 years old. You won't find evidence of them in the poetic Eddas, or the Sagas, or the Brehon Laws, or even the Carmina Gadelica. God, I can never say that word. 
<laughs> no indigenous oral histories carry stories about this holiday that we would recognize either. So what do we find? What are we doing if not reviving ancient practices? One thread that we do find in all pre-Christian cultures is a deep reverence for the family and one's ancestors. Your lineage and your family history told everything important about your place in the world. And it was your job not only to honor that, but to also work on becoming a worthy ancestor yourself someday. In the Havamal, which is eh, not really a holy book, but a book that um, Norse animists uh, use, uh, stanza 76 states, cattle die and kinsmen die, thyself too must die, but one thing never will die, the fame of one who has done well. Yes, the Norse are very serious. It's the Havamal. Living an honorable life and respecting and remembering one's ancestors who had also lived honorably was a central tenant of the pre-Christian peoples of Europe who most of us are descended from. How can we do that then, here, today? And why is it important? I believe our importance, its importance, lies in our sense of connection, not just to the past, but to each other. We live in times where our extended families are often scattered to far-flung corners of the globe. And sometimes we go long periods without seeing anybody but our closest family members. And then there is the reality that many of our families are mired in trauma and we don't necessarily want to connect with them. What do we do then to feel like we belong somewhere? If it's not a mother or father or grandparents that we want to remember an honor on this day. That is when we can go further back into our ancestral line because there is someone there who is watching over us. There is always a connection there. We simply need to open ourselves to it. And so these rituals on this day not necessarily old or how we thought of them. But even if we are making new rituals, so what? People do that all the time and it doesn't give them less weight or meaning. In fact, it can often give them more because they're deliberately chosen. One meaningful ritual we can invest our energy into is an ancestor altar. Last night we built an altar here together to collectively honor our ancestors. And we're using that altar again today. It includes names and pictures of many of our beloved dead, as well as items to celebrate this time of harvest. Many people keep their ancestor altar up for the entire month of October, and then sit and have an evening of meditation and remembrance on Samhain to be fully with their honored dead before they dismantle their altar until the next year. They leave a light on in a western winter window for the entire night to guide the death, the dead beyond the veil. Some choose to keep a small ancestor altar up year round and add to it as relatives die. This is a personal practice. and Whatever feels right will be right for you. We honor our dead today. We take this time, when the veil is thin, to feel our connection to them, to those we love and remember, and even those further back, whom we might not have known, 
but whose hopes and dreams we carry forward in our blood. Our grandmothers and grandfathers watch over us. And they are proud of us. Of this I am sure. Proud of how we have survived and prospered in this difficult and often confusing world we find ourselves a part of. Proud that we have so much more than they ever did and so many more choices. I've heard some people claim that our ancestors would think us weak and would be ashamed of how soft we are in comparison to how hard they were. I don't believe those people have ever held a child and wished every good thing for them. And so as we sit with our ancestors today, breathe this knowledge into your bones. They are with you. They watch over you. They want your good. And they believe in you. Our job in the here and now is simply to work on becoming good ancestors ourselves, to hold that love and carry it forward for all our relations. And we are going to take an opportunity now to sit and do a little bit of guided meditation. So I invite you to just make yourselves comfortable. Close your eyes. Let yourself feel your feet on the floor. Breathe in deeply. Settle yourself. As you inhale, breathe all the way down towards your toes. And as you exhale, breathe out all the way up to the top of your head. Let your breath fill your body. Ground yourself into the earth. As you continue to breathe, begin to visualize in your mind a forest and a path. And you can begin to walk along the path. The day is warm and bright. And as you walk, you come to a gate. Beside the gate, there is a large, beautiful ash tree. You open the gate and continue along your way. path leads to a meadow. There are beautiful wildflowers. The sky is blue. The sun is warm on your shoulders. 
This place feels safe. Remember to breathe deep and even. And as you look across the meadow, you notice someone coming towards you. It may be one of the people whose name you placed on the altar today. one of your other relatives who's passed recently or many years ago, or an ancestor you never knew personally, but they've come with a message for you today. Step forward and embrace them. Embrace the joy in seeing this person whose blood and history you carry forward. and take these few moments to listen to whatever message they have to give to you in this time apart from time in this place beyond the veil And though the sun is warm and you could stay here a long time, you can see your person looking over their shoulder longingly and you know that it is time for them to depart. And so you embrace them one last time and give them any words that you need to before they go. And then step back and watch them move back across the meadow and through the trees as they slowly fade from view. Breathing in, you can take one last look at the sky and the flowers. Feel your feet firmly planted on the earth. and turn back to the path.
walk back through the trees. Come back to the gate and the ash tree. Step through the gate and back into the world. Allow the forest to fade from your mind's eye. Breathe in deeply. Slowly wiggle your fingers and toes. Bring yourself back to the room. And when you're ready, slowly open your eyes. Thank you for sharing in that meditation with me. Are you up next, Reverend? Hmm. I'm almost awake. How about you? A couple more breaths. We accustom our eyes to the light. My thanks to you, Erica, for leading us in that beautiful ceremony and meditation. I saw my mom and my grandma, Sadie Newell Morrison, who I never met as she died when my mom was six, leaving 11 children at the age of 35. Blessings upon all of you and all of your relatives that you found through the gate and in the meadow. What a week it's been. I've been shopping, gathering, hauling bales, stringing lights, figuring out the fires, and decorations, and then preparing for our guests. And they arrived last evening thanks to our connections here that we have into the community and into with the Pagan community and the outreach that the Dragon Youth did to promote last night's event. My gratitude to everyone that was here that promoted it. How many of you were at the event last night? Quite a number of you. Some of you weren't there and arrived and got to help out. Thank you, David. So how many of you um, thought about going but weren't able to go? How, how many didn't know about it? It's okay. Yeah. I was so excited to see so many people that I had never seen before here last night. And, and so, so many people that had never even heard about us before. Our fabulous DRE, Oksana Atwood, told me that she had conversations with families that mentioned to her, we, UCE, is what they are looking for. We are what they are looking for. Let that sink in. Somebody said to me, I didn't know you could be a pagan or a Buddhist or a, you fill in the blank and still be part of a church. People are longing to be part of something bigger than themselves. Some place where they can attend a service, events, help out with social justice initiatives, learn and grow spiritually or personally, they're the same thing by the way, and a place where their children can get religious exploration or education. We offer a lot. And we can offer so much more. Samhain is a time of putting away the harvest, of acknowledging that the old ways must die. 
of remembering where we came from and honoring our ancestors. We dress up to allow our ancestors to walk among us unnoticed so that they can pass by us unawares and whisper in our ears. We listen to what our loved ones might be saying to us to help us move forward to learn something new about ourselves, perhaps. So think about this. What would our Unitarian Universalist Unitarian Church of Edmonton ancestors be saying to us today? What advice and compliments do you think that they would whisper in our collective ear? What words of encouragement would you expect to hear from someone that was part of this congregation, say, in the 1940s, or the 1930s, or the 1950s, or the 1960s? What would they think about what's going on now? Would they think we're on the right track? Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, I guess we're on the right track. Okay, thank you for that. Now, I have to tell you, I don't like Halloween. I really hate Halloween. I always have. Except when I was a kid and I... Had, but anyway, it seemed to me that Halloween was just an awful lot of work. Having parented 16, I think, 17, 16 or 17 children, and having little kids for about 25 years, I got really tired of figuring out costumes. Who's going to take the kids out? Who's going to give out the candy? Who's getting sick now? <laughs> Who's monitoring, monitoring all the candy intake? Who's sneaking and stealing somebody else's candy? How many pillowcases of candy? do we really need to have in the house anyway? It was just a series of jobs for me. So once I stopped parenting little children about eight years ago, I hung up my witch's hat. So I decided Halloween was not for me. Lights out, I'm out of here. However, learning about Samhain has spoken to my Celtic heart. My family is from England and, North, and the northern England, Ireland, Scotland. Um, my, the Morrisons came from the Hebrides in the 1700s from the Isle of Lewis. And so these traditions are beginning to speak to my Celtic heart. And I sort of feel like maybe I can claim some of these Celtic traditions as they are from my culture. But being raised in a very Christian family, pagan rituals were very much frowned upon. They were a little bit scary even, I could say. Folks, we put on a very successful event last evening. And we have some people to thank for that. First of all, I would like to thank Janet Polkowski, our office administrator, for bringing up the idea and spearheading the planning. It was her idea. It was in her heart that we should do this. The planning team consisted of Janet Polkowski, Oksana Atwood, Allie Hamilton, and myself. So many others to thank. Maida, if you're online, thank you. She supplied all the hay bales, traffic cones, the strings of lights along the fences, and she did a lot of work to get them here, and then to get them home, Maida and her husband. They came and got them last night. I'd like to thank Reverend Brian Kiley for preparing the chili for us. I'd like to thank Dragon Youth for helping out with promotion and face painting. Erica, thank you for organizing the ceremony last night and again this morning. Marilyn Gay for facilitating the labyrinth walk. There were kitchen helpers. There's a few kitchen helpers here today. Who was a kitchen helper, clean upper kind of person that was here last night? Thank you. 
We had Hail Bay lifters, thank you David, pumpkin carvers, teen bean bag and frisbee th tossers and throwers, and some of them threw them a little too hard, I was noticing. So we do have a few broken frisbees that I must replace. And then we had fire starters. We had a young, young Simon Polkowski was looking after the fires. And also to thank Annie Alley Hamilton for um, creating a tarot card reading room and, uh, and for her connections to the pagan community, which really got a lot of people out. People were lined up the whole evening waiting to get their tarot cards read. She barely had a break, and I had a hard time getting into the lineup to get my cards read. <laughs> and she didn't actually get any food, because she was so busy reading cards. Putting on an event like we, ha we did last night took a lot of work. And I have to tell you, a lot of the attendees were people I had never seen before. So to me, it was worth every single little bit of the work. Those of you that are here and participated in the work, could you please stand up? You can stand up too, David. <laughs> Let's give them a hand. Thank you. All right, do you guys think it was worth it? Th that, we're, that we're here last night? Okay, great. First annual. First annual. I so often hear, oh, our congregation is aging. We have to be careful about our volunteers. We can't do things. Well, that's not the story I saw last night. And I don't think that's the story I think our ancestors would be seeing either. And it's definitely not what they would be whispering in our ears as they passed us by. Samhain is a time for reflection, and it's a good thing for us to be doing today. What do you think UCE has to give up in order to grow? Could be thoughts. It could be things like, oh, we're to this to grow. What do you think is the potential for UCE. If our event last night told me anything, it's that there is a lot of un untapped potential out there. However, it will take lots of work to figure out the combination of what we need to be doing to get folks to know we are even here. The staff, along with Ali, spearheaded the event and we put in a lot of work to make it happen. We wanted to do this event. We absolutely wanted to do it, and we wanted to show what an impact events like this can have in our community. And I think we were successful. What do you want to do next? Soup Sundays. Okay, we can do that. More importantly, where do you want to help out? What would our UCE ancestors be whispering in your ear during this time of the thinning of the veil? I invite you to listen for them. So let's just take a moment to reflect on the notion of our UCE ancestors, urging us on, keeping us focused on what is important as we create vibrant community for the next, and the next, and the next, and the next generations. So may it be. Amen. Just take a few moments of silence, and then we will sing our closing hymn. We are. I'll do that in the benediction. Thank you for reminding me.
just want you to know I edited that. <laughs> and I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> and my apologies with my long-winded components to this program have brought us a few minutes past um, 11.30. But um, it's nice to know that I'm, my, my mistakes are not the only glitches in this service. And somehow we come through with the content and the meaning of, of our intentions. Now, hmm, we're going to extinguish the flame. Erica will come forward to do that. And I have a reading by Cornell West, who is the contemporary and well-respected philosopher and has no relation to Kanye West, who we will not be quoting today. <laughs> These are Cornell West's words. We need the courage to question the powers that be, the courage to be impatient with evil and patient with people, the courage to fight for social justice, in many instances, we will be stepping out on nothing and just hoping to land on something. But that's the struggle. To live is to wrestle with despair, yet never allow despair to have the last words. Hmm. On our way out, Erica has provided us with little tobacco pouches for you to take home. You may take one on your way out. And I offer you these words of benediction. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world, for things can break. And things can be mended, but not with time, as they say, with intention. So I invite you to go and love intentionally. Love extravagantly. And love unconditionally, for the broken world waits in darkness for the light that is in you. So go in peace, my gentle people. Go in peace. And now let us sing our linking song, Carry the Flame, stand as you are willing and able. No holding hands, unless you like to hold hands, unless you're used to holding hands with the person that you're holding hands with.